Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we're back here today with our next edition of Top 10 Cards from E3 Volt. However, a bit of an exception today, since we're doing the colorless cards and artifacts are like the main thing of E3 Volt and Kaladesh in general, we had to expand out to 10, because there's four mythics alone for artifacts, so we're doing Top 10 colorless cards from E3 Evil. And like every day, I'm joined by Chaz. How you doing today, Chaz? I'm doing well, yeah. There's really just a ton of stuff. We could not cut it to five. We're going to try to get uh, through all of them. I think ten was a good number. Super excited for today. Uh, yeah, me too. So, well, since we have so many, let's jump right into it with our first mythic. Ganti's Ether Heart makes some energy, gives you some extra turns. What do you think about this one, Chaz? Did you have a hand in this set? <laughs> Did you design this card? Because I feel like somewhere they had you in mind with Ganti's Ether Heart. I mean, what better way to make energy, take extra turns? Like, this is clearly a card for you. Yeah, this is definitely a me card. Taking extra turns is one of my favorite things, and I'm mostly excited because it's colorless, which just gives you so many more possibilities. I think throughout Magic's history, to take extra turns, you almost always have to be blue. I think there's a couple weird red ones that have major downsides, like, oh, you lose the game the next turn, but uh, there, this is really cool because it gives your mono green deck or your mono red deck or mono black deck a way to potentially take an extra turn. I don't know what that means right away, but most of the time when I'm taking extra turns, it's because it's part of a combo where I need one more turn to win the game. And being able to do that in any color definitely offers some potential. However, of course, it does require a lot of energy. The good news is it's pretty easy to make energy. If you're playing an artifact heavy deck, you can really ramp up your energy pretty quickly. So I don't know if this will really see standard play, but I am in love with this card. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you said, it's pretty easy to get energy. I mean, you have a lot of cards that give you a very good amount of energy, especially early on, like with the puzzle knots. Maybe you, maybe this could even like slot in somewhere as a one-of with like Tezzeret or something. You can ramp into it and then play another Ethereum uh, cell to get another additional two energy because it's not only Gonti's heart that gives you the energy, but anything that comes in after it. So maybe you really do. I, it could be conceivable that you take an extra turn. I don't know if you're what you're going to be doing on that extra turn <laughs> standard, but maybe dropping a land, but that's always good enough. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a, a good uh, way to counteract Emrakul, right? They steal your turn, right. and you just take and it back. take an extra turn. <laughs> yeah, that really sticks it to them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't really do that. That's actually a horrible plan. I was joking. Uh, anyway, <laughs> let's move on to a card that definitely has some constructed ramifications. Heart of Kirin, only a Sierra Angel for two mana. What do you think, Chaz? Yeah, if you liked uh, Smuggler's Copter, well, then you're going to like uh, a kind of an updated Smuggler's Copter that is now a 4-4 with Vigilance. And I understand Crew 3 is a little bit harder than Crew 1, but not really. I mean, you still have some under-costed creatures like Scrap Heap Scrounger that can crew the vehicle really easily. You have a, a bevy of playable Planeswalkers to feed the, the alternate crew costs, like Tezzeret, like Liliana, uh, Sahili... So uh, even Nahiri. So there's a ton of different good planeswalkers that are still in the standard pool to uh, not only crew this natural way, well, like I said, scrap heap scroungers, but to continue feeding this with uh, loyalty counters to not only play offense, but defense as well. Yeah, we talked about this one at length, I think, on the podcast. This was like the first spoiler, I think, of Ether Evil. And my feelings on it are most decks are still going to want Smuggler's Copter. And... The exception, I think, is if you can consistently use Planeswalkers to help crew it, uh, then I think this card is very good. I could imagine it in Super Friends list. One mark against this card, and Smuggler's Copter for that matter, is the presence of Fatal Push. Uh, that's a really good, clean answer to Heart of Kirin at any time. So it'll be interesting to see how that aspect of it shakes out. Is that going to push those cards a little bit further down in the format, just because you have a one-mana instant speed answer? Uh, 
Uh, that said, it seems really sweet with Planeswalkers. So we'll see if there's a green-white tokens list that's looking to curve out Planeswalkers, if this could be part of it, or even a more controlling Planeswalker list that is looking to use this to defend their Planeswalkers and then kind of go Celestial Colonnade mode to finish off the game once you kind of gain control with your Planeswalkers. So I think there's potential there. Creature decks will stick with Smuggler's Copter, I believe, but some decks will really want the Heart of Kieran. Uh, moving on to our next card on our list, we have a card that is oozing combo potential, Paradox Engine. Chaz, what do you plan on untapping with this one? Uh, I don't, I really don't know, but I'm assuming it's going to be something. How long do you think this stays unbanned in, like, Vintage or something like that? Like, this this can't be sticking around too off, uh, for too long, right? I mean, it's just so easy to make five mana in that format. And who knows about standard? I mean, there's still, like, Cryptolith, right? There's there's ways to make this good. Yeah, I'm really surprised at just how few restrictions there are on this. It's not, like, an instant or sorcery spell, or it's not uh, untap your creatures or untap your artifacts. It's just untap everything that's on a land. And it's when you cast anything, there's just so few uh, restrictions to make this work, which means it's actually super hard to brew around because there's so many possibilities. You can untap all of your mana rocks. You can untap all your creatures with cryptolith rights. You can go spell-based and use spells and card draw to try to keep cycling through your deck. There's so many things you can do with it. I expect that this card will have potential in almost every format of Magic. Uh, the fast mana formats in Legacy and Vintage, where you can get this on the battlefield super quickly. You could have some sort of storm deck. In Commander, I'm sure there's all kinds of combos and there's plenty of tutors available so I wouldn't be surprised to see it comboing off there. In standard, I think it's mostly Cryptolith rights. Whether or not that's good enough, maybe? I have no idea. There's so many combos in our current standard. We're gonna have to wait and see what rises to the top but I think it's on the list. I could imagine a list that was powerful enough in standard that it could compete with those other combos. So I'm really excited for it. I have no idea where we're going to use it, but I'm sure it's going to be broken somewhere. It just, it seems too good not to be. Yeah, I mean, this is, sometimes cards kind of get lost in the hype, right? Well, just to make sure, just keep your eye on this one, because like said Seth, I mean, and I agree with you, it, it's going to be somewhere and again, maybe it's vintage or legacy, and who who knows how how many people really care at that point. But I mean, it's it's going to be doing some really absurd things. We have one more mythic from Ether Evil in the colorless category, and that is Planner Bridge. So, uh, what is there to do with this beyond putting an omniscience on the battlefield, Jazz? <laughs> I. I don't know, but uh, that's pretty good in and of itself. <laughs> uh, we did discuss this on the podcast, if anyone did listen to that. We're kind of torn, but it's it seems at least serviceable, maybe outside of Constructed. I don't really see this anywhere in Constructed formats. It's just way too much mana. There's probably better ways to be doing what you're doing anyway. and But outside of that, at least it's it's good enough to maybe throw a, a one you know somewhere in your commander list uh, might not be every single commander list, but if you need an effect like this, I don't think it gets much better than this. Um, so there's been one previously planar portal, and that's kind of similar, but now we have planar bridge, and maybe we're bridging ourselves into other universes. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, I think this is mostly a commander card. Like you said, I don't think there's many ways to really make this work in constructed formats. It's just super expensive. But in big mana commander decks, especially ones uh, maybe like green decks that don't get as many tutors if you're playing mono green and going big mana, I could see this being a pretty good card in some of those decks. And being able to cheat the card directly on the battlefield is definitely a big upside over planner portal, which just, it's a little cheaper, only six to activate, but it only puts the card into your hand, so I think being able to cheat on mana essentially, if you think about it, you pay six for Planar Portal, you pay eight for this, so it's two more mana, but if you're putting a six or eight or ten converted mana cost card on the battlefield, you're actually gaining a lot of that mana back that you aren't gaining with Planar Portal because you gotta actually cast the card that you search up, so I think there's potential, but it's mostly just for big mana strategies in Commander, I believe, is the only place I really see a home for it. 
Next on our list, entering the world of rares, we have another vehicle, Ether Sphere Harvester. So, uh, if there's one thing we've seen, Smuggler's Copter is definitely not the biggest of the vehicles that fly anymore. We've had a ton of vehicles that just trump Smuggler's Copter in the air. Are they as good as Smuggler's Copter? Maybe not, but what do you think about this one, Chaz? Standard potential here? I think so, and I'm dubbing it the Copter Stopter. So... <laughs> <laughs> it, you're right. I mean, we we now have some really good viable ways to stop the early aggression of uh, Smuggler's Copter and what have you. Obviously, this is great if you can put plus one, plus one counters on it. It gains lifelink a, a couple of times. So if you can keep making energy and keep giving this lifelink, you can kind of battle your way back uh, in, a, in an aggressive uh, matchup when normally you really didn't have that option. And uh, again, th this is, <laughs> yeah, Smuggler's Copter is not the largest vehicle in the skies anymore. So uh, this does even block uh, Heart of Kiran profitably. So you get a little bit of uh, lifelink out of it. I think it's a pretty serviceable, maybe a one of main deck in a, in a vehicles list or certainly in the sideboard. Yeah, one thing we've seen with vehicles is you really want that low crew cost, and Ether Sphere Harvester is about as cheap as it gets at crew one, so it has that crew cost that lets you crew it with uh, Thraben Inspector, for example, and Bombant Courier, which we've seen be a really big deal for some decks. Also, it does also block Archangel Avacyn, which is pretty relevant in some matchups. It pretty much shuts down uh, the entire blue-white flash stack or blue white mid range whatever you want to call it all those flyers and spell quellers once you get this down you're not only blocking them but you're also getting a lifelink which makes it pretty unappealing for your opponent to attack into them and plus you can just let it sit back as a vehicle to dodge declaration in stone and stuff like that so i think this one has potential as well there's the real question is how many vehicles can you put in your deck we have so many powerful vehicles now with copter with heart of kieran with uh ether sphere harvester there's just so many i think there's diminishing returns and there's there's got to be a cap on how many you can play i don't think you can just play play sets of all four of those or three of those in your deck because you got to have stuff to crew them with two and you got to have lands and probably some spells so the question is how many can you actually play and something's going to be the odd vehicle out whether that is either to your harvester heart of kieran probably not smuggler's copter we'll have to see how the format shakes out but i think there is a cap and something is going to get left out. Speaking of flying around in the skies of Kaladesh, we have Hope of Gurupur, which reminds me a bit of Xanted Swarm, I think the card is, Chaz. Uh, a green card that's also one yes. mana and flying. What do you think about this one? Yes, a, a really good imitation of Xanted Swarm. Unfortunately, you lose the Hope of Gurupur when you have to use the ability, but this is, this is kind of interesting. Uh, obviously, it's a legendary artifact creature, Thopter, so everyone out there, I'm sure, is really excited to build around this if they want Copter Commander. Oh, that's actually, that's actually a pretty good deck. <laughs> Copter <laughs> Commander. Um, deck list uh, based around Copters, or Thopters, I guess. Ah. It, it's an aggressive one-drop. I don't know if it edges out Bomat Courier, but in those like control matchups, you can really stop some some weird stuff from happening on the other end of, uh, you know, having them draw cards at an opportune time, having those removal spells. Uh, so hopefully this sees play somewhere. I I'm kind of on the fence, but it's a cool card at the very least. I think this card has potential to be a standard and maybe even modern playable and in standard it might be a staple so here's what i see if you look at xanted swarm the main way that card is used is in combo decks and xanted swarm it does the same thing except it doesn't uh, die once it attacks and isn't blocked your opponent can't cast non-creature spells for the rest of the turn so hope of gurupur uh how i see this working is we have 
all the combo decks. Etherworks Marvel. We have potentially Splinter Twin. We have all these combo decks in standard. You play this card, you get in with it, you sacrifice it, and then it basically says your opponent can't disrupt your combo this turn. You can play your Etherworks Marvel, not worry about it getting countered. You can play your uh, random white four drop with your Sahili down and start comboing off, and there's nothing your opponent can do to stop it. So I like that it is kind of the combo protector, and I think for that reason, it could see play in modern as well. Xantid Swarm still sees play in Legacy to protect combos, and if you're playing uh, some sort of Ad Nauseam deck, some sort of Storm combo deck, this could be a very realistic uh, part of your strategy, uh, maybe not in your main deck, but in your sideboard, if you're playing a uh, blue red storm against a control deck with lots of counters, this is exactly what you want to make sure you can force your combo through and win the game. So I think this card is going to be very, very strong. You know, to that end, and uh, you make a really good argument, and I haven't, you know, looked at that uh, side of the argument. You're absolutely right. Maybe, and I've been playing Infinity a long time, maybe, just maybe, it has a good enough shot to maybe not only in the main deck, but the side, well, certainly the sideboard, but the main deck, because it can really stop those inopportune moments of getting Hercules Recall or Shatterstorm out of the game. So I understand, like, you want your Signal Pass, you want your, your, your one drops, but that all doesn't do anything if you're going to lose the game anyway, so... Maybe this has a shot. Moving on, we have another combo piece, one of many from Kaladesh. M Metallic Mimic, sort of a really odd lord. So, Chaz, what's your take on this one? Yeah, so we mentioned this earlier in the series. I really like this card, and I, I know I didn't, like... Again, I, I kind of looked at this at face value, and I kind of dismissed it at first, and I still am going to dismiss it in certain... I guess tribal aspects like I don't see this in modern merfolk I don't see this in goblins or something like that but where I do see it interesting enough is maybe this is good enough for Eldrazi in modern I mean you play this metallic mimic on turn two and then you can play a uh, what's the flying the sky spawner that's pretty nuts with a metallic mimic out so there's that aspect of it. In in standard, you have it's kind of almost like a Thopter sword combo and metallic mimic and now animation module. I know everyone's been talking about that. Whether that's good enough, uh, because it doesn't seem a good idea to stall out the game when they're trying to just ember cool you. <laughs> but uh, so we'll see where that goes. But it's it's certainly interesting to have that in standard going forward. And I know there, there's going to be a rotation. These cards are going to stick around for a long time. So. Maybe that just edges out being really good. Uh, yeah. I think that the combo in standard, I don't know if that's good enough. The problem I see with it is it, it is pretty fragile. Metallic Mimic, despite all the good sides, uh, is only a 2-1 and can die pretty easily. As far as modern tribes, I know it's not a really mainstream tribe, but one where it fits really well is Shaman because Shaman's main plan is to uh, basically Hell Rider you to death with Rage Forger, which is like a 3-mana Hell Rider, but it only triggers off creatures that have plus one, plus one counters, uh, and that's mostly uh, the Shaman. So you play Metallic Mimic, that makes sure that all of your Shaman have plus one, plus one counters, your Burning Tree Shaman and all this stuff kind of flood the board, and then just Hellrider your opponent out with Rage Forger. So it works really well as a Lord in that tribe. But the biggest thing for me with Metallic Mimic is now we have Metallic Mimic and we have Adaptive Automaton, uh, or automation, and that means that any random weird tribe, squirrels, or I don't know, uh, cats, or whatever weird thing you want to play casually, you now have eight lords for, which is actually really awesome. That's kind of the minimum number you need to play a tribal strategy a lot of the times, and there's a lot of really interesting tribes out there that just don't have the lords to support a casual, fun tribal strategy, and I think because we have these two cards now, the possibilities are relatively endless as far as what janky casual tribes you can play on your kitchen table, so I really love the card because it opens up all these other tribes that were just a lord or two short from not being competitively playable, but being kitchen table playable. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big deal. Up next, we have a card that 
is, I guess, sort of tribal. Vehicle tribal. Peace Walker Colossus. Pretty big. Massive crewing cost. However, it lets you kind of animate your vehicles for mana instead of with crewing. So, do you see this card, Chaz, as something that sees playing standard or not especially? I'm leaning to not especially, but it is good enough. I mean, it doesn't need to be crewed to make it, you know, great. Like you said, it, it has the ability to make other vehicles just into creatures now. So it's almost like you could think of it as like an enchantment with upside because you could just play it as a three and then you have the ability on it. So you don't really need any crew uh, again at that point. And then if you really need the six power, you can find a, a way to, to crew it somehow. But there's not that many creatures in standard that are going to be able to crew this. And at that point, you're crewing at four and you're only really upgrading to six. So I'm really more interested in just the ability itself. Yeah, it is sort of like a vehicle lord. And as far as standard play, I don't know. Maybe there's a way of making it work. It's a powerful effect to be able to repeatedly crew your vehicles without creatures. The thing I like about it, though, is I think wizards with Ether Revolt, adding all these vehicles, adding SRAM, uh, we already have Depaula and Veteran Motorist, I think they printed enough stuff that even if the tribe doesn't work in standard, you can probably make a semi-legit vehicle tribal deck in Commander or in a casual setting. So I like that they put enough stuff in just these two sets to make that possible, because that's always a risk when you have a entirely new card type like vehicles, is that you just don't have enough of them for people to be able to play them, then they kind of fade away. We kind of saw that with Allies after the original set in Zendikar. They were really cool, and they were pretty popular casually as a creature type, but there just wasn't quite enough of them. I think Wizards really did make enough vehicles and enough Vehicle Matters cards to kind of not have that problem with vehicles in Kaladash. So I'm happy that they managed to do that, and I think Peace Walker Colossus is a big part of that, and kind of expands what vehicles can do uh, by getting rid of that crew co cost requirement. Moving on to our next card. We have a card that I think you're higher on than me, Chaz. So, Scrap Drawler, I kind of immediately wrote this card off because it doesn't look like you can combo with it the way it's worded, and you know me loving combos, but you seem like you kind of like this card, so why don't you take it away and tell us what you like about Scrap Drawler. It's a great value creature. I'm not concerned with really comboing off, but it, it just seems great to, to have this out on the battlefield. You have you know, previous artifacts that you could be dropping before this, like um, uh, your your Smuggler's Copter, your Bomac Courier, and as long as Scrap Trawler is out, you just keep getting repeated, uh, just a repeated source of value until they get rid of it. So, and even, and even then, Scrap Trawler gives you uh, some value on the way out. So, again, I think it's just a three-mana good stuff card to have in a, you know, maybe a one of or two of in a, in a vehicles list or what have you. One thing I do like about it is we have the puzzle knot cycle. Now we also have a, a one mana egg cycle, uh, impediment, something like that, that you sacrifice to like gain a couple life or do random things. But I think there are some ways to generate value by sacking your old your own artifacts. Now, we also got the ATOG functional reprint, some stuff like that that we didn't have before. So there are ways where you can kind of generate value by sacking your own artifacts. Before Ether Revolt, it was kind of like metalwork Colossus and it had to be in your graveyard and it was pretty hard but now I think there are some more pieces we mentioned before and it still hasn't really happened but the sort of like artifact aristocrats idea and this could definitely be a good value generating card if you have a deck that's actively looking to sacrifice your own artifacts for value so maybe there's some more potential there than I'm giving it credit for obviously you need a artifact heavy list and it is worded in a way where since the converted mana cost has to keep getting lower and lower it's going to be hard to uh, go infinite with it or anything but it can generate a lot of value if you can get two or three cards back from your graveyard with this city on the battlefield that's pretty much worth its cost as a colorless three two for three which is already not above the curve by any means but not a horrible body it's not like a one one for three to have this ability so maybe there's some more potential there as you mentioned as a value card so i guess we'll have to see how it shakes out 
Yeah, and I guess just the way they were spoiled, I kind of just saw this following up a Heart of Kieran, so you don't even really need Planeswalkers at that point. And if anything were to happen to your Heart of Kieran, well, you have Scrap Trawler to get it back. That's a good point. Combo. That's a combo. <laughs> Moving on to our last colorless card from our top 10 from Ether Evil, we have basically a Triskillian Hangerback Walker hybrid walking ballista. So, Chaz, what do you say about this one? Well, it's a good thing uh, Mephidros Vampire is no longer in standards. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that uh, and Tooth and Nail and, and what have you to uh, do some weird shenanigans. But I think it's great. I don't know if it's... I don't know if you can really do anything with this in standard in terms of like really combo off with this in some way, but maybe there's something out there that I haven't seen before. So I haven't seen it, but that doesn't mean it's not out there. Yeah, and I mean, it's not horrible as just a value creature. I know one of the things that made Hangerback Walker so good is that uh, not only did it grow for a cheap cost of only one mana and tapping, but it also made you a bunch of Thopters when it died, and you don't really get that with Walking Ballista. However, the cost is the same, the double X cost. It does have a way to grow itself, although it requires a bunch of mana, but you can still uh, kind of a hedge against flooding if you got nothing else to do with your mana you can always dump an extra counter on your walking ballista and then being able to ping like Triskillian is actually pretty powerful uh, there's a lot of thopter tokens and servo tokens that may be running around in standard and being able to kind of just shoot them down one by one is pr a pretty relevant ability to have so I don't know if this can see hanger back level play but I think that it offers enough value in different ways that it's at least worth considering in standard and like you mentioned uh, you may have combo potential with like Micaeus the Unhollow and other things like that in other formats like Commander uh, so there are some interesting tricks you can do with these kind of cards in other formats so I think it's a really cool card and I really like it and I like the mixture of Triskillian and Hangerback Walker whether it's actually good enough for standard only time will tell so Chaz we've reached the end of our artifact section so what is your favorite colorless card i guess artifact card from ether evil it's gonna have to be paradox engine i mean i just i look at that card so many fun and potentially crazy things are going to be happening with uh, that are based around this card so can't wait to see them uh, I think I'm going to go with Gonti's Etherheart. Taking extra turns, very me, and I'm sure <laughs> we will be playing a lot of that card in Budget Magics yeah. and against the odds over the next year. So No surprise there, Seth, but that that is your card. It's going to be Seth's Aetherheart. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, anyway, that's been our top 10 colorless cards from Ether Evil. So thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with another one. And big thanks to you, Jazz, for taking the time to hang out. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is super fun. So see everyone next time, and thanks for joining us.